So did anybody tear a pec tonight bench pressing? Like, I want to know, did that happen? Yeah. You, somebody actually did? Are you kidding me? Oh, you told, all right. No, that's not bad either, right? <laughs> No, guys, like, uh, I got to tell you, man, this is great to be here. I've been looking forward to this for quite a while for, man, a number of reasons. Number one, I love your pastor. Like, Nathan is a great friend of mine. Uh, dude, every time I'm with him, I feel like I'm better. Um, I hope you know how much of a real deal he actually is. Like, he's great in this setting, but I see him in closed, uh, behind closed doors when there's nobody else around. His integrity and his love for Jesus is through the roof. I hope you realize how blessed you are to have him, because you really are. You very much are. If I lived here, I'd follow Nathan, no question. I'm also excited for you to get to meet Clayton tomorrow. Clayton's also a great friend of mine. You'll get to hear him speak tomorrow. There's nobody like Clayton, and every time I'm with Clayton, I leave better and I leave laughing. So it's a privilege for me to be with, here with those two guys. Second, like Nathan said, man, I live in Colorado, but I grew up I grew up in Hendricks County. Like, I'm a Hoosier. I graduated from Brownsburg, so this is my roots right here. So it's pump, I'm pumped to be back in Indiana. And third, the thing I'm most excited about for this weekend is what's going to happen here for the next 24 hours. Like this conference is not just here at Northview. This is happening in churches across the country where thousands of men are getting after it, taking steps, taking steps to be uncommon. Because unfortunately, what's common now with men today has completely taken over. What's common for men today is discouragement. I, dude, I just feel discouraged. I don't like where I'm at. I don't like who I am. I'm discouraged in my job. I'm discouraged in my marriage. I'm discouraged where things are going in the world. Discouragement are common today. So are men that are just beaten down. Like maybe you came in here tonight just beaten down by life or maybe you're just beaten down by the narratives today that say men are the problem. Beaten down men are common today. So are men who are passive. Passive instead of leading. Passive instead of protecting. Passive instead of standing up against what's wrong and standing for what's right. Passive men have become common today. So are men who are disengaged. Disengaged from their wives and their kids. Disengaged from their responsibilities. Disengaged from their purpose. Disengaged from Jesus. Disengaged men are common today. So are men who are absent. Absent for the fight for their families. Because I hope you realize this, right now there is a massive, massive battle going on for your wives, your kids, your grandkids, and your friends. And so many men are, are just absent, physically, emotionally, maybe both. The same thing is true about truth. There is a massive battle for truth right now, and, and where are the men? Because absent men are common today, and so are men who run. Instead of standing up, Instead of walking forward, instead of doing something hard, instead of doing what's right, instead of leaning into conflict, not for conflict's sake, but conflict that's needed to bring about resolution so other people thrive. Because when men stand up, women and kids thrive. When men are weak, innocent people get hurt. But today, men just run. Maybe that's by being numbed out by Netflix. I don't know. Maybe it's running through some form of escapism where you think you get this false sense of success through video games. Maybe it's porn. Maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's alcohol. I don't know what it is. But right now where we need men to actually lean in, what's common today is men just run. Like that stuff's common today and it shouldn't be. Like I'm just giving a list. You, you could probably add things to that list right now of things that are common for men today but shouldn't be. And none of us want that. Like, I know you and I are just getting to know each other, but here's what I know is true about you. I know this is true about you. You don't want to be discouraged. But you don't want to be passive. You don't want to be disengaged or absent. You don't want to be beaten down. And I know you don't want to run. You don't want that. I don't want that. We all don't want that because it's not what we're wired for. Like, we're wired for the opposite. All of us want to be a warrior. All of us want to be in a fight for something that actually matters. Like all of us want to be a protector. All of us want to be strong. All of us want to be a man that can be counted on. There's a reason we've all pictured ourselves with our faces painted blue, wearing a kilt, charging a battlefield. Don't act like I'm the only one that hasn't thought of myself that way. You have too. Man, we've all thought about, hey, how would I do on Omaha Beach? Would I make it through the bullets? Would I get to punch some Nazi in the face? We've all thought about what would it be like to run into a burning building to pull as many people out as we possibly can. Something like that because men were meant to be protectors. Men were meant to be leaders, meant to be encouragers, equippers. Men are meant to be liberators. But unfortunately, that's uncommon today. 
But you and I can change that. There's a guy who's a great example of this, fantastic example of this. This dude was a straight up warrior, courageous leader, did some insane things, liberated his people from some, some pretty serious oppression. But it didn't start that way at all. Like usually we think about, hey, we just see the end product and man, I'm not like that. But no, that's not how the story starts at all. This guy's name is Gideon. And we're going to look at Gideon throughout this conference. But before we can get to Gideon's story, we actually have to go backwards and start before his story. Judges 21 sets this up perfectly. It gives the context almost perfectly. It says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. And everybody did what was right in his own eyes. Is that not our context today too? Everyone doing what's right in their own eyes. I mean, right now, today in our culture, the greatest possible good is to do whatever feels good to you because if it feels good, then it must be right. Self-actualization has become the highest value standard and truth is now based on emotions. And if you really think about that, that's pretty terrifying because emotions change. So does that mean truth changes too? I mean, how's this working out for us right now in our culture? Everyone doing what's right in their own eyes. Man, when I look out there, what I see in our world today is I see a lot of fear. I see a lot of hostility. I see a lot of tension. I see a lot of pain. I see a lot of confusion. And I see a lot of division. Is that fair? Would you, would you agree with that? No, you wouldn't agree with that? Oh, you can speak up. Yes, yeah. yeah, that's us, right? That was Gideon's context too. It's the exact same thing. Like what was happening was Israel had been blessed by God and provided for over and over again. He freed them from Egypt, but then time and time again, Israel would just abandon God. And whenever that would happen, it would always get to a point where God was like, all right, cool. And if you don't want me, if you don't want to follow me, okay, I'll leave you alone. You can call that the passive wrath of God. And that's a terrifying wrath when God goes like this. Okay, fine. I'll give you what you want. He would leave them alone. And whenever that would happen, they also then had to suffer the consequences of being left alone by God. And it was never good. It didn't take very much time at all for Israel to be overrun by another nation. That's exactly what's happening when Gideon shows up on the scene. The Midianites had been oppressing and overpowering Israel for seven years. Like it gotten so bad. They would just raid Israel over and over again. They would steal their livestock. They would steal their crops, mainly wheat. And if you live in the middle of an agrarian economy, that's bad news. They would steal, they would raid, they would kill the men, they would assault the women. It got so bad that not only was Israel hiding any food that they had, then they started to live in caves so they could hide themselves. Like imagine this. Imagine if the Taliban overpowered us. Well, Matt, I don't, I don't know if that's really accurate or that could actually happen. I don't think that's in the cards either, but neither did Israel. Like if, if the Taliban was the controlling force here, we would hide our valuables, wouldn't we? We'd hide our wives and our kids. We would not live in our neighborhoods anymore. We'd go, we'd go hide in the woods. If we're out where I live, we'd go hide in the mountains. If the Taliban was the controlling force here, they would steal, they would raid, they would rape, and they would kill. Imagine what that would be like here. That's what was going on in Israel. All the stuff that happened on October 7th last year, that's not too different than the context that Gideon was living in. That's not too different from what Judges 6 looked like. Like, here's the story. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree of Ophrah, which belonged to Joash from the clan of Ebenezer. That's not how you say it, but if you ever don't know how to say a name in scripture, say it loud, fast, and confident. Everybody will think you got it right, okay? Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide, to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. <laughs> Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us. And he handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength that you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. The Lord, Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. And I'm the least in my entire family. Then the Lord said to him, I will be with you. I will be with you. And you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. That's a big call. 
mighty hero. Some translations actually say mighty man of valor. Go with the strength that God has given you. Go with the strength that you have. Go rescue your people. Go rescue Israel. And to hear that, that's kind of awesome. Right? If somebody came to you, if God came to you and said, hey, I want you to go rescue the United States from the Taliban. You, Matt, go. The Taliban, go take care of them. I mean, that'd, be, that'd be pretty awesome. Like, I think all of us would be fired up to an extent, and then we would pause and start to let that sink in, and I think we would start to freak out. Wait, wait, hold up. You want me to do what? Now, I, I, I don't have the strength for that. I, I don't have the, the skill set or the training. You need to talk to my buddy. He's an ex-Navy SEAL. That's the guy that you want. That's what Gideon thought. He thought he was weak and unusable because he was comparing himself to the world standards. Gideon was no William Wallace. He was no John Wick. He says, I'm weak, I'm unusable, because look at everybody else. The the clan that I'm from, the group of people you're talking to, is literally the weakest group you could talk to. And then in that group, I'm the lowest dude on the totem pole. But that's not the way God sees things. In 1 Samuel 16, God says, the Lord sees differently than you do. People look at outward appearances. The Lord looks at the heart. And that's where you find a real man. It has nothing to do with physical ability or strength or talent or your resume. A real man is found when you look at his real heart. But Gideon didn't get that. Man, he thought it was all about resume. He thought it was about ability and he thought it was about physical strength. So he says, man, I'm weak. So then why would the angel call him a mighty hero? Mighty man of valor? Why Why would he say something like that? Go with the strength that you have. The reason he's saying that is because of who is with Gideon. He was really clear. He said, the Lord is with you. I am with you. So that's what you and I need to know. Strength is a promise of God's presence. That's what strength is. It's the promise of God's presence. That's the source of strength. So you got to ask yourself, hey, who is the source of my strength? Am I the source of my own strength? Is it on me? And there's part of that that's kind of virtuous, right? I need to get strong. I need to make myself stronger. I need to be stronger. There's some virtue in that. Like you want to be physically stronger? You want to be a stronger leader, a husband, a dad? You want to be stronger in your job? Like there's good, there's virtue in that. But then is it going back to what's the source? Like, is it all on me to be strong? Am I the source of my own strength? And if you are the source of your own strength, you will never be strong enough, The world is too big for you. There's too much coming at you. And I'm not even talking about the spiritual battle that we're all facing. If you are the source of your own strength, you'll never be strong enough. And you will always be weak, at least in your own eyes, because you're just going to compare yourself to every other man out there. But if God is the source of your strength, if it's him, that's how a guy who's weak and unusable can lead and rescue when on paper looks like the dude's walking into a massacre. Strength is, the pro- strength is the promise of God's presence. Gideon didn't believe that at first. He also didn't believe that it was God talking to him. When Gideon realized that it was an angel of the Lord, he cried out, O oh, sovereign Lord, I am doomed. I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Back then when everyone had an encounter with God, they would think that they're going to die right there on the spot. That's why he's saying that. It's all right. The Lord replied, don't be afraid. You're not going to die. And Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and named it Yahweh Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. That night, the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that's seven years old, and pull down your your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah, which is another false goddess, cut down the Asherah poles standing beside it. What's interesting about that, the Canaanite false god for Baal. Whenever they would cast Baal into an image, into a metal image, you know what the most probable thing that they would turn him into, that idol into? A bull. So go take the bulls to pull down the bull. God's mocking Baal right there. That's what he's doing. Then built an altar to the Lord, your God, here on the hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully, sacrificed the bull as a burnt offering on the altar, using as fuel the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and he did as the Lord commanded, but he did it at night because he was afraid of the other members of his father's house and the people of the town. So here's where the rubber meets the road. This is what you and I have to know. 
the thing that will hold you back from whatever it is that God is calling you to are your own altars. Like as a man, that's what will hold you back. Your own altars, whatever they are. Again, maybe you're in a spot right now where you're like, man, I'm ready. Man, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be a part of whatever God's called me to. Like I'm ready to be a part of something that actually has purpose and actually matters. I want to be a rescuer. I want to rescue my family. I want to, I want to rescue the truth. I want to rescue purpose. I want to rescue people who are being taken advantage of. I want to rescue people who cannot rescue themselves. I'm ready to be a part of whatever it is that God is doing. That's why I signed up for this conference. Like I'm ready to be a part of something that matters. And if that's what you're saying, I would say, that's awesome. Me too. But before God is ever going to work in you and before he's ever going to use you in a way that all men want to be used, you got to tear down your altars. You have to before we're ever going to see any change around us because we would all agree that our world right now is pretty jacked up. Is it not? Everybody doing what's right in their own eyes because of that, man, when I look out, I see more division than I have ever seen in my lifetime. I see that today. Today, I also see people constantly at each other's throats. Today, you see, Man, a dominant ethic and a narrative that gives the middle finger to God's design for sexuality and gender that not only has become mainstream, but now it is pushed and celebrated in a way that is absolutely destroying individuals, marriages, families, and now kids, God forbid. Like today I see things like every time you turn on the news, everyone's freaking out. What awful thing happened today? Today you see fear about what's going to happen next. What's going to happen next with things like the economy? If you're in your 20s right now, how am I ever going to buy a house? Or fear what's happening next with global conflicts. What's going to happen with Israel and Hamas? What's going to happen with Russia and Ukraine? And then there's IU basketball. <laughs> Dude, what's going on with my Hoosiers? All you Purdue people are like, ah, this is great. Ah, it's great happening. Yeah, well, you know, you're going to be out in the first round of the tournament anyway, so... <laughs> I'm just bitter, okay? We're not even going to make the tournament. But the fact that IU basketball is in the state that it is in right now, I'm glad I live in Colorado so I don't have to deal with it right here in the present. But that shows that there is something messed up in our world right now. But whatever the issue is, like whatever it is, I think it's really easy for you and I to just start saying, man, why is this happening to us? That's what Gideon said. He said, why, why did this happen to us? Where, where are all the miracles at? But that's the wrong question that you and I need to be asking right now. Instead of asking, why is this happening to us? The question that you and I need to ask is, man, what altar do I need to tear down? I was talking to a guy that did some work with churches in India. India is a very polytheistic culture. And he said, uh, when he went over there for the very first time, he saw idols, like actual physical statues. We're, we're talking Indiana Jones stuff. Saw that everywhere. Saw these statues, these idols everywhere. And people are praying to him. People are worshiping these statues, these idols. He saw all over the place. And one of the nights he was there, he got to have dinner with this pastor who's from there and planted all kinds of churches all over that region. And they're talking at dinner and he said, hey, you know, have you ever been to the United States? And the Indian pastor was like, yeah, yeah, actually I have. I've, I've been once and I really enjoyed myself. And he said, well, tell me you didn't go just to Disney World in New York because there's more to the United States. And did you enjoy yourself? And, and the guy said, yeah, man, I, I loved it. I really enjoyed myself. Oh, cool. Would you go back? And the Indian pastor said, oh, no. No, I would never go back. And the, the guy I was talking to, he's like, well, well, hold up. You just told me that you really enjoyed yourself. And now you're saying that you would never go back? Like, why not? And the Indian pastor said, because there's too many idols in America. Your idolatry is too much. Do we see that? Because the thing that will hold you back from whatever it is that God is calling you to are your own altars and your own idols. And the things that will keep us asking, hey, why is this happening in our culture? The things that will keep us asking that question are our own personal idols. So forget about talking about what's happening out there. Quit looking out there, looking at everybody else. Don't look at whatever Fox News tells you is the problem or what CNN tells you is the problem. Quit looking at Instagram or TikTok. Before we can ever look at altars out there, we gotta look at altars right here first. 
Our altars are great at getting us to look outside of ourselves and saying, see, that's the problem over there. Everybody else, everything else, that's the problem. Don't look at what's happening to you. Don't look at how it's tearing you down. No, look out there. But we can't do that anymore. Our altars are great at blinding us to the fact that they are altars. So if you ever want to know how to tell if that's true or not, if you've ever said something like, hey, this really isn't a problem for me anymore, or this really isn't an issue for me anymore, or that happened a long time ago, it's really not affecting me, or I've got this under control, I can stop whenever I want. When you start saying something like that, when you're justifying something that's hitting you like, man, this isn't right. Can we hold up on the music for a second? When you ever feel like something doesn't sit right with you or somebody else says that's not right or points something out to you and you start justifying it, you might actually be justifying an idol that you're you're blind to. And once you're blind to any kind of altar or idol, it'll start tearing you down. Idols will tear you down every time. Altars will tear you down every time. You get to choose. You get to tear it down or it gets to tear you down. There was an English pastor named John Owen. He lived in the 1600s. He said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. It's incredibly true. And everything in scripture will tell you that. The way we could say it right now, looking at Gideon, you can either tear down your altars or they'll tear you down. They'll tear you up. And then they'll rob your strength from you. Strength is the promise of God's presence, right? His presence is the source of strength. Here's the thing. God will not share his presence with an altar or an idol. It's not how it works. He's not going to do that. Well, Matt, like, dude, why is this fill in the blank never working out for me? Like, why do I keep having issue after issue? Like, why is God not working in me and working in my life the way I see him working in my friend's life? Like, why is God not with me? I know he's called me to this. I know this is what he has for me to do, but why is he not with me? Man, I can't answer that question for you. I, I, I don't know. I don't know that anybody can answer that question for you. But the first question I would ask you back is, what altars do you need to tear down? Like, I don't get to do whatever I want sexually and expect God to use me. That's not how it works. I don't get to be an absolute jerk to my wife and then expect him to give me strength. Not how it works. I don't get to be my own God and let my pride drive me and expect God to be with me. That's not how it works. Your idols idols and your altars will tear you down if you don't do it yourself, and they'll steal your strength from you. And then they get passed down. Gideon's dealing with his dad's altars. Altars get passed down a whole lot easier than faithfulness does. So you get two choices. It's this easy. It's this clear. Two choices. You can either tear your altars down or you can pass them down. You get to pick. And it's one thing for me to get torn up by my own altars. It's an entirely different thing for my boys to get torn up by the stuff I passed down to them because I wasn't man enough to tear them down in the first place. I'm not okay with that as a dad. And I know you're not either. Like we don't want to do that to our sons or our daughters. And maybe you got stuff passed down to you, generational stuff that's just destructive. And you've been dealing with it your whole life. Your family's been dealing with it your whole life. The great news is you can break that chain right now. It's not too late. And if your kids are grown, you can still tear that stuff down. You get to tear it down or you get to pass it down. If you choose passing it down, you're also going to pass down the pain, the loss, and the consequences that you experience too. We can't be okay with that as men. Amen. And then once you pass them down, you're already controlled by them. Altars will control you. It's really easy for you and I to think that, no, no, I got this under control. I got this. But that's how altars keep you under their control. They make you think that you're in the driver's seats. Baal, one of the primary false gods from the Canaanites that Israel kept falling for over and over and over again. He's the reason why the Midianites were ruling them for seven years. Well, Baal was believed to be the creator and giver of all life, that he was the god of prosperity which is also, I think it's interesting how, do you know what, what statues right outside of Wall Street? A bowl? I don't know. He was also believed to have complete control over nature and over man. And that's partly, partially true. A false god, an idol, an altar will absolutely control you. Absolutely will. If you let it. That's why God tells Gideon, tear it down, bro. It's time to tear it down. So let's be real. What do you need to tear down right now? Like, what altar do you need to tear down? Because an uncommon man is honest with himself about where he's weak and what altars he needs to tear down. Man, common men will lie to themselves. So if you want to be common, go ahead and lie to yourself. 
common men will justify altars that they have. So if you want to be common, justify away. Go at it. Common men will be apathetic about the altars that they have, but an uncommon man will tear down the altars he has in his life. So what is it for you? Like what altars do you have? Is it, do you have an altar to pride? This is a really easy one to talk about with guys because we all wrestle with this one. Is pride your altar? Is that it? Pride is the, the rejection of God as God and it puts you as God instead. If you pull back the, the layers of almost every sin at the root, you're gonna find pride. Sure, pride can be the whole dude walking into a room with his chest puffed out saying, look at me, look at me, with all kinds of arrogance. That's pride. You want to know what another form of pride is? Woe is me. Woe is me. Woe is me. Eeyore is another form of pride. Guys, like, that's one that I've had to wrestle with over the last couple of years. Dude, look at, what I, look at the mess I have to deal with. I didn't create this mess. I'm in a hole that somebody else dug. Look what I have to deal with. Woe is me. That's pride. That's pride. It's an altar to me. So it's just putting your head down, putting everything on your shoulders and going and saying, I got this. You as your own strength, that's an altar to pride. Is that what you need to tear down? Or is it bitterness? Give an altar to bitterness. Like something happened to you that was just flat out wrong. Like you were abandoned or betrayed or abused. I mean, this is safe in here. Let's be real. Raise your hand if you've ever been one of those three, abandoned, betrayed, or abused. Raise your hand. Yeah, me too. So you're not alone. Now, what can happen with those things is if you don't take care of it, a little bit of bitterness can take root. And if bitterness takes root, it will eventually control you. And the altar will look like this. You will start to have fantasies about that other person and fantasies about their demise. Well, I hope they get what's coming to them. What they did to me, I hope that happens to them. That's what the alternate of bitterness sounds like. And then what you've done is, without even realizing it, you've actually attached yourself emotionally and mentally to that person. So if they're doing well, you're doing terribly. But if they're doing terrible in life, you're doing great. You're on an emotional and mental roller coaster that is attached to somebody else. That's what an altar to bitterness will do. And when you're bitter, nobody else wants to be around you either. Bitterness spreads. So do you have an altar to bitterness that you need to tear down? Is that what it is? Or maybe it's an altar to affirmation. Like affirmation is a great thing and actually we all need it, but it can turn ugly pretty quickly and unhealthy. Like maybe you felt like you never got affirmation before at all. So you're looking for it wherever you can find it. Honestly, in my opinion, that's one of the biggest drivers with the sexual ethic today. It's because if I adhere to this ethic, this sexual, sexual ethic that the world is putting front, in front of me, you're not allowed to argue against it and I will automatically be celebrated and I'm getting affirmation. It's a dangerous thing. Do you need it in, in your job? Do you need it in an unhealthy way from other people around you? Man, dads, if you have, if you have kids in ho- at home right now, especially if you have sons, Make sure that you're telling them often that you love them and that you're proud of them and specifically why you're proud of them. If you're not doing that, they're going to spend their entire life looking for affirmation from you in all of the wrong places. But right now, maybe affirmation is an unhealthy idol for you, an unhealthy altar that you need to tear down. Or is it sex? Are you being controlled by lust? Is that your altar? Maybe it's porn. That's an easy one to go to, too. What porn will make you do is it'll make you think that you are the only one that struggles with this. That nobody else deals with it. You got to hide in the dark. By the way, is there a lot of valor in hiding in a room so you can look at a screen? No, because it's controlling you. But the data says that more than half the guys in this room struggle with porn. And maybe you're like, well, I've tried to tear it down before. I've tried, I've tried, I have this, I have this issue and something bad goes wrong or I, I just need to numb out or I, I feel entitled by this. So I'll just look for a little bit and then I get sucked down the rabbit hole once again. And I can't get out. Man, I've tried to tear that down. I get it. That's hard. But you know what Gideon did? He got 10 buddies. 10 dudes tore that altar down with him. Maybe you need to get some people to help you. Maybe you need to tear down the altar to pride first so you can go ask 10 friends, hey, I need to do this. And if we can't talk about this in church, where are we going to talk about that? Man, this has got to be a safe place to tear that altar down. And if somebody comes up to you, maybe you don't struggle with this. If somebody comes up to you and tells you and asks for your help, man, that is an honor that you don't know. Get after it with that person. 
Maybe that's the altar. Or maybe the altar is politics. Especially in 2024. Be informed. Please be informed. Have your own political convictions. I absolutely do. But the Republican Party and the Democrat Party become altars really easily. Or maybe the altar is the way people define you. Maybe somebody said something to you years ago that was just horrible. They told you you weren't worth it. I had a guy look at me once and tell me that I was worthless. A boss straight in my eyes told me I was worthless. Or somebody said, you're just going to be a screw up the rest of your life. You're always going to screw something up. That happened to you years ago. And now you've spent your life trying to prove that person wrong, which is just another way of serving an altar. Like you don't have to do that anymore. Or maybe you're letting the the narratives of today define you too. The narratives that say that men are the problem and that they're so much toxic masculinity. Like, are you letting those narratives define you? First of all, there is no such thing as toxic masculinity. Like, you know, that doesn't exist, right? Are there toxic men? For sure. And almost always, those are men who haven't torn down an altar that they still have. Or do you have an altar to yourself? where you are your own God. That goes all the way back to Genesis 3, when Satan said to Adam and Eve, did God really say? Testing God's, the truth of God's word. And then he says, you can be like God, AKA you can be your own God. You know what the dominant religion in the United States is right now? Number one religion, humanism. Humanism, that's the leading religion in our culture, where you are your own God. So if you have an altar to yourself, then why would, I, why would you not use the money, your money, however you want it? First of all, it's your money, right? I can spend it and do whatever I want with it. I need to give offerings to myself. I can do whatever I want sexually. That's a way that I want to worship me as God. I can do whatever I want sexually. Or you know what? I need recognition. I need people to recognize how great I am, that I am my own God. Do you need to tear down an altar to yourself? Like, I don't, I don't know what it is. Like, I don't know what it is, but I'm just giving you examples and I'm asking you to be real. Like whatever the altars are that you have right now, tonight's the night to tear them down. You're here for a reason. Maybe it's this, to tear these altars down right now. Tear them down so that you can then go tear some stuff down. As a man, you are called to be a light in a very dark world. Do you know what light does to darkness? Tears it down. You're meant to be tearing down some darkness. So we've got to start by tearing down the things that are tearing us down so that we can go out and tear down the darkness. Because you know who suffers if we don't tear down darkness? Our wives and our kids, our culture. The local church is the hope of the world. And if we don't step up and do this, nobody has hope. And right now, there's so many of us in this room that if Jesus came back today, it'd be awesome. Like, I'm down. If the eastern sky split open, he came back today, that'd be pretty awesome. But there's also thousands and thousands and thousands of people right out these walls. There's people in your circles of influence that if Jesus came back today, it would be a horrible, horrible day. As a man, you can't be okay with that. So why would we not tear down altars that are getting in the way of that? Like, you want to be used. You want to be a warrior. Like God has gifted you. God's given you strength. He's called you to something meaningful, not just in this simple, short life, but that will have eternal implications. Why would we let a stupid altar get in the way? Like, so whatever it is, tear it down now. And the great news is the burden is not on you, oh mighty man of valor, because God is with you. He's the source of strength. There is so much freedom from whatever sin or altar is controlling you. The battle has already been won. I've read the back of the book. We win in the end. It's awesome. So whatever it is, you came here tonight, whatever it is, whatever that altar is, be honest with yourself and tear it down. You've got a paint stick sitting on your chair. Grab this. And whatever marker there is right by it. If you don't have a marker in your chair, there's somebody else that's got one around you. Man, sometimes it's good to have this physically in our hand to see this. So what I want you to do is I want, to wi- I want you to write down that altar that's in your mind right now. Write it down on this paint stick. Take a second. Write it down. And then be a real man. Flip it over and write the real thing down that you need to be writing down. And then when you're done writing that down, we're just going to break them. And when you do that, pray over it. And then I also want you to listen because there's going to be 200 other paint sticks in this room that are being cracked and broken at the same time. 200 other altars that are being broken by your brothers. You're not alone. And maybe you need to take this home tonight. You don't need to break it here. Maybe you need to take it home tonight with it written down in front of your wife. Break it in front of her. 
That sounds good, doesn't it? You hear that? Break them. I don't have to control you anymore. Break it. Write it down and break it. And if you need another one, come up here and grab another one. Hear that sound. You're not alone. Oh, mighty man of valor. God is with you. God has given you strength. God has given you brothers. Let me pray for you.